into the conversation, sure. invite our audience in. Um, hello, and welcome to the second season of the Aperture Photo Book Club. We have another whole great season lined up, but we are going to begin tonight with a discussion of the shortlisted books from the Perry Photo Aperture Photo Book Awards. Um, a few words about tonight. You know, what is this photo book club, you may be asking if you're tuning in for the first time. And the, we established the Aperture Photo Book Club as a way of thinking through how can we share um, the joy that these books bring us. How can we bring other people into the conversation of the book as a vehicle for an artist's voice? This is something that Aperture has been doing for a very long time. And what you'll see tonight are not Aperture books, but all of the other different solutions and proposals um, and questions and answers to what a book can be and a, specifically what a photo book can be. So Aperture was founded in 1952. Um, as a quarterly magazine dedicated to photography and creating community and understanding through that, um, we published our first book, Leslie, in... 65. Thank you, uh, Edward Weston. And since then, um, Aperture has published over a thousand titles, but we intentionally hold our own titles back from these awards so as not to bias uh, the process. So what we'll be talking about tonight are a group of books uh, that these distinguished jurors chose as part of the Perry Photo Aperture Photo Book Awards. So, let's think. Oh, a couple of things. One is that this is meant, uh, all photo book club gatherings um, are enlivened by your questions and so we encourage you to put them in the chat and then somebody puts them up on the screen for me and I'll read them out to all of you. You can ask a question about a particular title that's coming up or of any of our distinguished jurors. So don't be shy, put your questions in the chat and we'll ask them. And I also just want to thank for our second season of the Photo Book Club, Photo Focus, who have been an incredible sponsor, making it possible for us to bring some of our jurors in um, from near and far. So thank you to Photo Focus. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Aperture's creative director, Leslie Martin, um, who will tell us a little bit about this, uh, this incredible thing that she has, was instrumental in founding 10 years ago um, through Aperture and with Perry Photo. And Leslie, would you talk a little bit about the award? Sure, I mean, it has been such a great learning experience for me that's not why it started, but um, oh yes, it is. <laughs> it, it has been one amazing byproduct. But in 2011, we started recognizing that there was this tremendous uplift of photo bookmaking, and we, as bookmakers, recognize and learn from all of that amazing creativity that is out there in the field. And it seemed as though there should be some sort of way of finding a path through this tremendous output and signaling what might be considered a great book, a good book, and recognizing that there are many different types of books that people are making and being able to recognize excellence within those, those groupings. It just felt like the right thing to do in that moment. And here we are 10 years later. It's uh, been great. It's been wonderful to have the partnership of Perry Photo to be able to showcase these books. Mm -hmm. I think the other amazing aspect of this is it's not just one winner or two or three winners. It's a short list and it's so uh, delightful to see my fellow jury members from that short list here with us today. And our goal is to more or less curate an exhibition of all the different gestures and ways of making meaning that uh, contemporary practitioners are finding in this wide field of the photo book. So maybe what we'll do is we'll go let the or let our other jurors, because Leslie is one of, she's not only founded this, but is one of the jurors, but let's let the other jurors introduce themselves and then we'll dive right into the books, because we know that's why you're here. Um, so me, would you, would you like to start and sort of say just a line or two about who you are and why you think, you know, we chose you to be on the jury this year? <laughs> or, you can answer whatever. But. Hi, my name is Miwa. I work at the Dash of the Book as a photo book consultant, and I'm also a director of the Session Press. As a Session Press, 
I introduced that the emerging and the established Japanese and the Chinese photographer to the Western audience. And then I think I was chosen to be a jury because that uh, I'm kind of like a hot photo book person and they deal with that the client daily basis. I've been working for Dashwood for over 17 years. And wow. then so so I know like uh, what type of book appeal to the client and then what type of book is needed for that uh, audience. So thank you very much for having me here. We're glad you're here. Hi, I'm Clinton Cargill. Uh, I'm a, a photo editor at the New York Times, uh, currently focusing on live coverage and our digital presentations, um, but have a history of assigning editorial photography. Um, so I come to this process um, as a commissioner of work and uh, somebody who's you know been looking at bodies of work for 18 years, I guess. Um, that's all I have to say. All right, that's great. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Hi, uh, I'm Brian Wallace. I'm executive director at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, now relocated to Kingston, New York. Uh, and for 15 years, I was a curator at the International Center of Photography. So I've had a lot of experience working with uh, not only artist books, but exhibition catalogs. And uh, I'm a bibliophile. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Leslie Wilson, and I am Associate Director for Academic Engagement and Research at the Art Institute of Chicago, but I'm also a photo historian, um, and a lot of my work has uh, focused on kind of photo books um, and, and archival materials, and so I think that's part of what I'm doing here, but I also, um, uh, I mean, I think we all have very global dimensions to the kind of um, work that we do. I tend to kind of focus on Africa and the African diaspora, but I was really excited about the opportunity to look more broadly at the whole field through this. Well, thank you. Um, Leslie, I knew why Leslie chose all of you, but it was interesting <laughs> to hear you. Um, so maybe it might be interesting to begin also just by saying, was there something you learned or most enjoy? You know, this is a rare opportunity for us and for everyone to get to hear from the jurors, like, what was it like? What did you learn through this process? Or what did you enjoy most about the process of being a juror? Because it's, I, I did it once and it, I loved it. But I'll, I'm curious to hear what you thought. Well, working at the Dash, we get like a new book all the time. And then I noticed that the when, I, when I was reviewing that uh, photo book um, at the Aperture, I recognized many of them. However, I still find that the unique book from Egypt, India, even Japan, and then it was such a joy to go through like a unique book that uh, we have like over how many people apply for this? So the total year? submissions are a thousand, right. more than a thousand. Right. And we do an initial mm -hmm. survey, and together we look at between 400 and 500 mm -hmm. titles over the course of three days of engaging, amazing mm -hmm. conversation where I learned so much from you and from each of the shortlist jury members about what I missed mm -hmm. in looking at a book. Mm -hmm. And so everyone brings their expertise yeah. to that. But when you break down the numbers, it mm -hmm. seems almost impossible that we looked at 500 books in three days. <laughs> I'm sorry you <laughs> did. <laughs> it's true. But yes. thrilling, exciting, enjoyable uh, to just handle these books even for 10 seconds and to get a sense of overall trends within mm -hmm. publishing. That was really exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a quality to the process that is very much like the Barnes and Noble on Union Square when I moved to New York 25 <laughs> years ago, where you, you, there are certain pieces that you, you know, can tell in an instant it's not for you, and then these other things that you sort of fall into, um, and really feel like I've got to, I've got to understand this better so that I can convince all these people that it's the best. <laughs> um, and I think that was exciting, and it was exciting, you know, to hear Miwa's perspective. We all bring a. A, you know, the, the sort of, the group vision was like much larger than I think what 
anything I could have brought to the conversation. So that was really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it was deliciously overwhelming. Like, I mean, you're, gonna, you're kind of walk into it and you see it all and you're just so excited. Um, I, you know, as part of my job, I'm part of the research center at the Art Institute, and so I'm in and out of the library and archives all the time. But I think it's that question of what actually invites you to slow down and really look. Mm -hmm. um, and not just look at kind of a thing here or there, or I think we tend to kind of focus on our areas of the field or like, you know, what research we're doing in a given moment, but just to really kind of look broadly and do that big scan of mm -hmm. everything. And I think it lets you see trends. It lets you see um, kind of what feels most urgent in this moment. Mm -hmm. But I think there are also some real surprises about, actually found myself really struck by some things we might think of as more traditional and that really hit. And mm -hmm. there are reasons why we keep coming back to certain kinds of themes. Mm -hmm. And so that was also really beautiful to see as part of the process. Mm -hmm. um. It's important to say also it was just unimaginably fun. You know, <laughs> 72 we hours. We didn't want this to sound like an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, I mean, right. I you have, brought like, this like, on. No. And we, it's well known that we are the best shortlist jury to date. <laughs> <laughs> best jury ever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, Wait, I thought mine was. <laughs> it, was just, it was just so much fun. It was like, actually like being in a book club with, mm -hmm. with you know, people who really brought it you know, enriched your perspective on everything. Yeah, that was the thing that uh, really thrilled me, was learning so much from each of you, mm -hmm. and Leslie, of course, but mm -hmm. each of you had different yeah. perspectives mm -hmm. and unexpected, and the choices mm -hmm. that each person made. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I wouldn't have suspected that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, well, we'll get into that, but I think let's talk about some books, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Leslie, the photo book awards are arranged in three categories, and I thought we'd begin with the first photo book award. Would you tell us a little bit about the overall structure and that category in mm -hmm. particular, and then we'll... Sure. So, as you said, three categories. The first photo book, very clear. These are books mm -hmm. where first-time photo book makers are welcome to submit. Mm -hmm. This could also include people who have done, you know, 20 small zines or their own self-published books, but suddenly it's their first book with an imprint or a right. larger publisher. Mm -hmm. So that category is, is well-defined, but there's, you know, things that are made on blurb, things that have been handmade. The range is really quite remarkable, mm -hmm. very expertly produced books by large publishers. And the first photo book, the winner of that category, is also receives $10,000. This is part of our goal to encourage future bookmaking. Mm -hmm. So really in looking at that category, we're thinking, who do we want to encourage to do more, to, to take that next step to their next book? Mm -hmm. When they get to that step, then they can enter into the photo book of the year. It's no longer their first book. That is really sort of the, the expert level, what is it, black diamond level, <laughs> the photo book of the year is where anyone from somebody who has made 20 books in their past to somebody who has made two can enter. And then because we realize that the catalog is its own sort of distinct animal, it's really a vehicle for a curator's body of knowledge and research and all of those things that come together, that has become its own third category. So recognizing that there are these different ideas, different audiences, and different ways of thinking about how you shape a book. That's why we have three categories. There is a winner in e of each t drawn from the shortlist of 35 books, five shortlisted catalogs, 10 photo book of the year, and 20 in the first photo book category. Um, the winner this year, I think we have a wonderful video. We do. Which so can maybe, be shown. Yeah, so we'll, um, we'll pause for a second. We're going to play a little video so that you can have a real sense of this book yourself, and then we'll jump back in. Take it away. Go ahead, Leslie. So I'm just going to, to mention that it's Sabia yeah. Chimen, 
and this is her first book. It's called Hafiz, and it's by Red Hook Editions here in New York. I'd love to hear my fellow juror members speak about why, as a shortlist, now I should say that the final, there is a final jury in Paris. We do our work to put 35 books on the table, and then a second juror of esteemed, uh, amazing people who in the field come and select winners in each category. So just from your perspective of having put this onto the short list, any, anything jump out about this book, about why we thought it was on the short list? Well, first of all, I love the fabrication of this book. It's just like a, you know, replica of that uh, their Bible Quran. Mm -hmm. And also, I love the fact that uh, this photographer portrayed that uh, young schoolgirl in a pastel way, like happy, joyful. You know, if we think about that uh, Turkish culture, we think that they are kind of mysterious and dark. You know, we don't know much about what they're go what's going on, but this r book really puts the light on that uh, young uh, Turkish girl having a daily life, just like American, mm -hmm. like a gossip girl, or, you know, like a young high school kid. Mm -hmm. And I thought mm -hmm. that uh, it's uh, such a refreshing take on that uh, subject. Yeah, kind, kind of, kind of an a rebuttal to otherizing. Um, it really takes you into the life of this, these schoolgirls, and it, 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 the, the, the binding was, I think, somewhat controversial in our discussions, but it, it yeah. does, as you look at it, you know, it gives, it's like, you know, a, a holy text by way of a trapper keeper, in a funny <laughs> sense. But, um, so quite beautiful, and like it, these, you know, the illustrations, mm -hmm. um, a bold choice, and it tells you something about what how to read what's inside. Well, that's the thing that struck me was it's so sophisticated mm -hmm. and well thought through yeah. everything from the graphic design inside the layout sure. of the pictures and this incredible binding. It's like, wow, this is somebody's first book. I think also the, <clears throat> the thumbnails in the back where all the information about each image also carries a really remarkable detailed uh, set of, of information that allows you to actually not just look and enjoy the fun, the beauty of the book, but actually to get a little yeah. deeper into the subject too. And mm -hmm. I think that is a really important pairing yeah, for true. that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, one of the things I love so much is the way that it, it kind of draws you in mm -hmm. and it, into a story about knowledge production, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about, um, you know, it's, it's a school where the girls are working on kind of memorizing the Quran. And I love that it, it asks you to look at photographs where we can think about how people learn mm -hmm. and people who are in the process of learning. It makes you think about memorizing and forgetting. Um, and also some of the storytelling that exists within the book is kind of reflecting on how kind of learning this transforms you, how it might be healing, um, and what in what ways can we see that potential through the book and through the craft of the book, through the photographs. It just all comes together to be an incredibly tender object mm -hmm. yeah. as, a, as a whole. Yeah, it's a, it's a gem. I, mm. um, but of course, you all shortlisted 10 books for mm. the first photo book. and 20. Sorry, Actually. 20 mm -hmm. for the first photo mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the correction. Mm -hmm. um, and Leslie, there was one, so we, we invited all of the jurors to pick one other book that was shortlisted but didn't win to speak about. Mm -hmm. And they fall into different categories. But um, one that Leslie chose is, is a wonderful um, counterpoint to this in many ways. So maybe if you would say a little bit about why you chose to speak about this book and some things you, what it is, why you chose to speak about it, some things you like about it. Yeah, so um, I chose uh, Marilyn Nance's book, Last Day in Lagos, that is um, uh, edited by Olaremi Onobanjo um, and is produced by Fourth Walls Books and, um, and Kara. And it is, uh, in, in many ways, I think to your point, it is uh, a book that you look at and you say, how is this a first photo book? Um, because it shouldn't be. Um, and it was a book that I think Marilyn Nance really imagined making um, in the 1970s after she'd come back from Festac 77, which was this incredible festival in Nigeria. Um, Just that say was that one more time. 
1977, <laughs> yes. she made these photographs. So okay. Sabia wasn't born. So just as a, <laughs> just as a point yes. of reference. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and so has been sitting on this incredible archive of, of material and knowing that it was really important and looking for an opportunity to bring it all together. Um, but in a way, it. It, like it wouldn't quite be this book, which is which is even more reflective, precisely because it it waited, um, and it's a book that I think really thinks about. Um, I, I find myself reflecting on something like yes, thank you, <laughs> Jennifer Bjork's um, kind of notion of the decolonial imagination, but I think it also engages diasporic imagination. Um, what is it that brings us together? Um, how did Festac function? And for Marilyn, I think it's a real reflection on joy mm. and the fact that this was a really joyful celebration. Um, and so I think one of the photographs that has really struck me as much as there's a lot of documentation of of people who you know kind of like from from this and like very clear kind of frontal views or candid views i really love this photograph towards the end of the book of kind of trapeze artists and this moment of like almost coming together and it feels um deeply poetic in relation to everything else and um a, a few last things i love the scale of this book mm -hmm. and the way that it kind of fits in your hand and that you know if if marilyn was thinking about festac 77 as a family album. It feels like a family album. Um, and it's one that's, you know, um, Antoine Bird in the book talks about, you know, an intimate perspective. And it really gives you that kind of intimate view yeah. on um, on a really huge, fest like literally huge festival. Yeah. Um, so and it brings it back really forcefully and, and really beautifully. Thank you. Also an amazing way of using text to support and to guide the viewer through here. It's really part of the structure in this case. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just so well oh, yeah. put <laughs> together. Yeah. So, yeah. Wait, say, that out. say it out loud. Yeah, yeah, so if you want to hold something real in your hands, you need to hold this, right? Mm -hmm. So this book mm -hmm. also tells you kind of what it wants you to do. <laughs> it sets mm -hmm. its own terms. Right. Yes. yes, and it sets its own terms for kind of, you know, how, how black people might imagine the future. Um, um, kind of uh, and a kind of dream of, of African unity that kind of is still before us um, and is not only of the past and so I love the way that it is it's reviving an archive but has us thinking about the future too. But it is extraordinary that it's referring to an event that was almost 50 years ago and that's what is the device to look towards the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very exciting in that regard. Truly. Yeah. But there's so many other categories oh and so many other books to <laughs> yes. talk about. Yes. So Leslie, maybe uh, if you talk a little bit about the, the second category and the book you're holding in your lap before we get to the Oh, yes. Edition. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about the catalog yeah. of the year. Yeah, then. the photography catalog of the okay. year. Let's talk about that. So, I mean, and again, the, the definition of catalog is a little bit more expansive than just a book that is created to sit alongside an exhibition, although that's often the case. It can also be the catalog of an archive. It can be the catalog of an experience. But really, it's about uh, a relationship to a set of objects or something that may be in an, ar an archive or a museum. Um, this is a really fascinating example and a little bit of uh, sort of, oh wait, was I supposed to talk about that? Yeah, yet? yeah, start Sorry. with that. Sorry. I just yeah. got so excited. Yeah, that's, no, we're just, <laughs> I, got, I agree. Going straight in. Sure. But so I'm thinking about, you know, this in a way it did accompany an exhibition, the 50th anniversary recreation of Diane Arbus's uh, uh, exhibition at MoMA in 1972. Mm -hmm. So that was the occasion on which it was published. But this is an, an archive and a catalog of response. And it's almost like the geological sediment mm -hmm. or record of the discourse that was inspired by this one body of work mm -hmm. of Diane Arbus's output. And it's just page after page of reproduction and it's not everything that was ever written about oh, Arbus. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's, a, it's not, not everything. There's it's actually not everything. in the back there's a record of there's a whole bibliography yeah. and you can see yeah. which ones were reproduced, which ones mm. weren't. Mm. But it's a fascinating um, sort of document, literally the title is documents. It's a mm. collection of documents. It goes from an exchange of letters where Arbus was pleading with the National Bibliothèque in Paris to please buy her prints for all of $100, all the way to you know these amazing 
um, extremely laudatory celebrations, looking back on the occasion of retrospectives of her work. So it's also tracing the idea of value and the value creation mm -hmm. around a body of work. I'm not showing good pages. Um, <laughs> but I love that they just like rip, took up the, the page of the uh, written review or commentary and have gathered it together. It was inspired by a binder that was created on the occasion of um, a retrospective of Arvis's work. And so this sort of replicates that idea of something a little rough and ready mm. and easy to the hand. But it's just, it's something that really rewards a close look. There's all sorts of hidden details that actually also reveal humor in this discourse when we think about it as having so much gravitas. Like there's this letters, uh, letters uh, to the New York Review of Books where Neil Selkirk sort of challenges Hilton Al's use of the word freaks and you know, Neil gets into it. Neil is one of, um, has printed, the only person who, is, uh, who has printed Arbus's work. And at the end of this, Hilton Al's replies, if you say so. <laughs> and so it's just like this great record of how people have engaged and, and of the response. I don't know how else to say it except um, This reception. may come across as a trick question, but it's coming from the audience, so apologies. Mm -hmm. Do we know who the designer is of that book? I can't yes, remember the name. Okay. I'm pretty, let it me double check, Yolanda. but I'm pretty sure it was Yolanda. Yolanda okay, Palma I thought so. I mean, right. We worked closely with the and estate. And there was another. Now, I will say, uh, so editorial director Lucas Zwarner, design Yolanda Cuomo, Bonnie Bryant, love a good colophon page, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and of course the estate and the gallery is also um, mm -hmm. involved in helping to select and shape it. But really kind of an extraordinary take on the catalog. It's sort mm -hmm. of subversive in its own way because it's not really a collection of the work itself. It's everything around the work. <laughs> But also like a, a book within a book as a, as a tactile mm -hmm. experience. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So you also get this, uh, it's sort of a record of the uh, criticism of photography too. Mm -hmm. Like who's writing at what time, what publications actually featured photo, you know, a commentary on photography, um, the ads, you know, that go alongside it. So it's, it's also this sort of chronology of the time period in which that work has been meaningful. So for those of you who might be worried that we're not gonna have time to talk about the photo book of the year, we will, so don't be <laughs> alarmed. But that, believe it or not, as wonderful as the book, documents book is, and I share your enthusiasm for it, it didn't win, which is actually a pretty interesting mm -hmm. illustration of the second mm -hmm. part of this process. Mm -hmm. The book that did win is also amazing yes. and also was chosen by all of you before we talk about it though we also have a little flip through video to help give people at home a little bit of a better sense of this so let's cue the video of devour the land and then we'll talk about it So now you know why Devour the Land, edited by Makeda Vest, uh, or maybe you have a sense of why that might have won the photo catalog of the year. Um, it was published by the Harvard Art Museums where uh, Makeda is the Richard and Rone Menchel curator of photography. And what I would love is to hear our jurors, you know, tell us a little bit about why you think you chose this one for the shortlist. Um, I, if I, I can just speak to the 
uh, speak to anything. The physical experience of, of this book, which is you know the the, the kind of rough metal binding and um, the it it sort of belies like how how deeply researched and intelligent the work is inside, but kind of creates this. I can't find any pages of pictures. Um, uh, there, there's it just it 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 kind of telegraphs the like academic sort of fervor mm -hmm. of, of what's inside and I think that I just loved the object for that reason um, I think also I mean having had the experience of witnessing both our discussions but also the final jury discussions which I'm not on but I chair one of the reasons why it was selected is how closely matched that form is with the content, this sort of ecological awareness mm -hmm. and trying to keep things fairly kind of close to the ground yeah. and not overproduced. But also in terms of content, it's a deeply polemical mm -hmm. and political book which you know, highlights in a kind of visual essayistic form the disaster, the ecological disaster that the U.S. military has created in the American landscape. So it counters the idea of the sort of beautiful landscape photography that is always celebrated with uh, more gritty and in some cases just shocking pictures of devastation in the American West primarily. And the urgency of that subject matter, right? Like that, I think that's a big part of what brought it to the top of the heap for us is that the we need to be having these conversations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this book does it so well yeah. mm -hmm. and it's so rich with content but it's the design and the way that these short trimmed pages signal different types of content and the organization of it is also very clear and easy to access mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it brings to the fore the kinds of, you know, how do we get at the story, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's the, the, the kind of documentation that's alive in this, but also the kind of very different photographies that are in this project. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of different practices. Again, it's the ways that, you know, some photographers are having a deep conversation with the legacies of a certain photography of, of the West that mm -hmm. we think of as so iconic. Um, and, you know, other photographers who are kind of using kind of military grade, you know, cameras and the, and the very technology itself to kind of engage in an almost abstract look at, at, at the landscape and the way that it brings all of that together I think is something that's really um, beautiful and it does feel just deeply urgent. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. Ah, I love this book best because that uh, yes it's text heavy you know however compared to the other short listed the best book of the catalog to give us uh, some room to really enjoy that the images slowly i see that there are a lot of space between the text and the images so that the viewer have a slow time to really understand that the what book this exhibition is about mm -hmm. I, I really like that the physicality of this book too yeah and um, maybe just to say the crass thing for interested parties who might be watching. Um, <laughs> I think our takeaway. Go there, go there. Our takeaway isn't that like metal binding and a kind of like lo fi experience of a book is what's hot this year. Mm -hmm. It's that this production is really in conversation with the material inside of it, mm -hmm. and, and that's what makes it so successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a really mm -hmm. important point. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, now, the pièce de résistance, the fo well, actually, they're all pièce de résistance, but uh, Leslie, would you introduce the third and final sure. category? So we have just plain old photo book of the year, but this is one of the most difficult categories because you have everyone really, you know, putting their best into amazing books, and again, uh, very experienced artists, not as experienced artists, and so you have an incredibly wide range of highly polished, very sophisticated titles with others that are still a little rough and ready but doing very interesting and challenging things. So um, 10 books, photo book of the year, and that's usually the largest category of submissions, uh, maybe close to what we get for the first photo book. Um, and for, shall I say the winner? Shall I announce the I, winner or are you going well, to? Well, maybe we'll do the winner last and instead 
we'll, this will be like our lightning round. Mm -hmm. So we'll say everybody get, everyone got to, pick, you know, pick a book mm -hmm. and <laughs> um, you can talk about it. Just sort of say briefly, like, why of the photo book of the year, uh, Miwo, maybe we'll start with you. Why, what did you pick and why did you pick it? And yes. maybe share a page or two from it. Um, I picked this book, Colin Hattoberg's River's Dream. And this one is like a second monograph by uh, Colin Hattoberg by same publisher, TBW. They are based in uh, California. Um, he took like over 10 years to complete this project. He received like a Magnum uh, Fellowship Grant 2015, and there are 65 color plate inside of this book. It's a very heavy book. And he told me that uh, all those images were shot in a hot summer day. And it's yes, it's really strong. And uh, he makes sure that the color plate plays on the right side, and the left side is always blank. Uh, to be honest with you, it took me a while to really understand that uh, his work because I'm from Japan. I really don't understand that the uh, Americana so much. I don't read that uh, American literature such as Hemingway or Faulkner. I should know, but um, I read the Japanese literature. <laughs> I'm not so into like uh, American literature so much, but to understand that the Colin Hartberg, it took me about two weeks, mm -hmm. but it grew on me. The reason why I love this book is that uh, I find out that the love and hope through this book, which is so unique to uh, American people and the American nation. I know American people are sometimes very self-critical about their own nation, but coming from Japan, I have to say American people are most welcoming and the nicest in the world <laughs> to the immigrant like me. Um, I noticed that the reason why I find that the hope and the love from this book is because that the photographer Colin Hattoberg pay respect and attention to the people in this village, in a small community in the northern part of the Florida. I don't find any judgmental observation from him to the people here. And then in the Instagram time, we tend to enjoy like a something provocative, like a expensive handbag or pretty people or sexy images. I don't find any single provocative sexy images here, <laughs> but I find that uh, his sincere, uh, careful attention to the people. No wonder that he took 10 years and then visiting the same family and the community. And he told me that uh, he used a medium format camera, Mamiya 7, to capture this moment. And then he sometimes saw into like conversation with the people in this book that he forgot to taking a picture. <laughs> That's how close he was with the, those people. Um, I see like a many photo book at the Dashwood book and when people come to the store and ask me for like a best photo book, I always chose this book to the uh, client because it's, I have to say, it's all about photography. It's not so much <laughs> about like, a, you know, gender equality or a, a social issue or environmental issue. Yes, those, subject is super important. However, he just uh, takes that uh, good picture and then respect it there, and then which is uh, kind of uh, not trend right now. Ha however, I have to say this is one of the most beautiful photo book I've seen last 17 years. And I'm so proud of him that uh, he completed oh. this project. <laughs> I to say, Sorry, I, 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 no, I, I, I said we said one line, but like that was really <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> and for Curran alone, I, Curran, I hope you're watching. I hope you, I hope you get to hear somebody speak with that kind of passion about your work. What a gift. So don't worry. That was, that was what an Tied amazing up. testament to that book. So thank and you. And an equally.
beautifully and mm -hmm. measured uh, creation mm -hmm. in yeah. the book itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like the the edges, the dyed edges, this you know wonderful marbled mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. it's no title or name on the cover. Right, right. <sighs> and <laughs> and <laughs> the, <laughs> we're not getting <laughs> the, the empathy that you talk about is also like deeply intentional in his process, right? Like the ten years, yeah. and and that um, that isn't some. Okay, but Clint, that's not. I know it's not, you, book, it's not my book. It's not my book. Talk about your <laughs> yeah, book, please. Okay. Tell, Tell us what you chose um, and why you chose it. So I brought "Look at Me Like You Love Me" uh, by Jess T. Dugan, and. Um, uh, I had I had known Jess's work over the years, um, but not ever worked together. Um, I I was really taken with the text in this book, actually, which is also written um, by the photographer. Um, it it is it's a photo book as memoir, which I find really fascinating. Yes. Oh, oh, I know. She doesn't like my post-it notes. <laughs> no, in the middle you of the would spread. never be allowed um, to work at MoMA. Just um, <laughs> and uh, so the way the text helps you, like, brings the intimacy of, of the experience of photographing, but also the, the experience of the individual subjects. And there's, you know, gender identity, <clears throat> um, trans exploration in here, but mostly actually just um, the desire to be seen and understood. And that's so beautifully kind of woven into her writing. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> beautifully concise. And what's the title? Uh, oh, yeah. Look at me like you love me, which is actually a Fantastic. fairly useful way into the book. Yeah. I'm obsessed yeah. with that title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you have something you'd like to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the book that I really was drawn to and I think is really one of the most important books, uh, not only of this year, but probably of uh, a decade, uh, is Flint is Family in Three Acts by LaToya Ruby Frazier. Uh, this is a book that uh, documents and responds to the 2014 uh, Flint water crisis uh, where the city council uh, of Flint, Michigan uh, diverted water from what was a clean water treatment plant uh, to an application of water from the Flint River, which was notoriously contaminated. And uh, within a couple of weeks of that switch, uh, residents of Flint, uh, uh, particularly poor black residents of Flint, uh, who are the predominant population, began to experience uh, negative health effects, including serious diseases such as Legionnaire's disease. So in 2016, uh, LaToya Ruby Frazier was hired by Elle magazine of all places to go to Flint and to document uh, the residents, to produce portraits really. And she created a much larger conception of this project. Uh, as she says, in the spirit of Gordon Parks, she wanted to use her camera as a weapon and what's exciting to me is she really has created a unique take on documentary photography. Uh, it's sort of signaled in this uh, in three acts part because she has three different creative solutions to looking at this uh, situation uh, and ongoing crisis in Flint. So in act one, she documented, first of all, the ongoing protests uh, in Flint about the situation. Two years after it first started, they're still marching, uh, producing these signs. Social activists in the community were objecting to the uh, neglect of this crisis, and that's fully documented uh, in Act One. Um, but the key to this book and what makes it especially political is that uh, Frazier insisted on embedding herself with a family uh, of artists and poets, uh, particularly an artist named Sheikh Cobb, who she worked with and collaborated with, uh, to really create a family story about the effects of this crisis. And they ultimately traveled in Act Two to, uh, to her homeland in Mississippi, uh, where they experienced uh, clean water coming directly out of the earth and uh, 
and raising of these fantastic uh, Mississippi stallions. And it was kind of the antidote to uh, Flint, Michigan, which was a decrepit post-industrial city. Uh, and then in, in part three, a, an, another incredible political solution uh, was they discovered there was a guy that had a machine that could extract fresh water from the air. So somehow, they finagled to bring this machine to Flint, Michigan, and it worked. And they were able to provide fresh water for free to residents of the neighborhood. And here you see it says free water, and people showed up with all kinds of uh, utensils to take off fresh water and to provide for their families uh, for the first time in years. Uh, so I was just so excited by this book because it really is uh, an incredible political document as well as uh, an extraordinary intervention in the uses of documentary photography and an extraordinary book produced by Steidel and the Gordon Parks Foundation. So, Thank you, Brian. I think so, and I get to talk about one too. <laughs> so, um, so the book that I'm talking about, even though I wasn't actually a juror, um, actually, what is the, how do you describe this kind of binding, Leslie? Exposed binding. Exposed mm. binding. So you can read the title of this book, The Scum Manifesto, mm -hmm. um, on the spine of it, and I, the, you know, the vulnerability and the violence of, that's embedded in this book, um, it declares itself from the start. There aren't that many manifestos being made these days. And yeah. if you think about the history of art, yeah. but Justine Kurland begins this one on the cover. She and her sister co-wrote this manifesto. I, Justine Kurland, am scum. I thrive in the stagnant waste of your self-congratulatory boring photography. And it goes on and on with uh, equal power and um, force. And although power and force are probably pretty similar. Um, but scum in this instance stands for the society for cutting up men's books. Sorry, just making sure I've got that right. <laughs> and indeed, um, as pro and it's a, a nod to Valerie Solanas, but as you go through it, there are, um, a, you know, collage or, well, I, yeah, collage upon collage, um, each constructed with um, ongoing sort of fluidity and imagination, so many different solutions to what it means to cut up pictures. But the part of the fun of this book, and that, oops, sorry, um, there's a lot of fun to it, is when you get to a collage like this one of Robert Frank's The Americans, and you begin to see, you know, what is it that you recognize about a book? And it, it's almost like a Rorschach test because for somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about photographers and photography, what is it that makes uh, the sort of el the elements of a book, like this woman's face from the movie theater premiere or the baby's face from Buford, South Carolina? It's like you see certain elements and you know immediately, um, well, <laughs> If you've spent a lot of time looking at the history of photography, and in particular photography by men, you recognize a lot of these things. Mm. And then what I, mm. uh, the last thing I, well, one of the other things I love about it is that at the end, when she gives the list mm. of the books from which each of these collages is drawn, she withholds the name as if, you know, so you're given the title of the book, it says the Americans, but you're gonna have to look it up if that name, if that word doesn't mean anything to you. And I just think that's such a, a wonderfully defiant way uh, to, to end it. So that is the one that I'm speaking about. Um, and wasn't the Marilyn Nance also in that category? Um, no, Marilyn Nance, I think, was one that could have been in. It was and in both categories. It was in, it, well, Leslie, would you like to speak to that? People are, I mean, you can enter as many categories as you want if you think your first book also served as a catalog and might just be good enough to be the book of the year. You could enter all three. But um, 
was, did that answer the question? Yeah, so, yeah. so we in caution fact, you to think right. hard about that. <laughs> no, so we, we were basically, so, Mar so Maryland's book was shortlisted for the first photo book. Uh, yes. Because it, it also may, have, you may have wanted yes. to make it we, a photo book of the year. It could we it, yeah. <laughs> we, thought, we thought about it a lot. And actually, there was something about really emphatically announcing its firstness yeah. that, that right. spoke to the journey that that book had been on. Yes. And that felt really important um, yes. as, as, as part of its own story of saying that, you know, worth the wait, wish, but it, it shouldn't have waited wait, that long. We shouldn't have right. had yeah. to wait yeah. that long for that book. Good point. We um, should mention the winner yes, of exactly. that category. Yes, exactly. Let's turn to the winner. Leslie, would um, you like to introduce it? And, or should we watch the short video about Mohamed Borisa's Paterfarik and then, yes. and then we'll talk about it? So cue the video, please. Great, huh? Leslie, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you're holding in your hand? Sure. So, I mean, I think this is a great example of thinking about each of these other amazing books in that category. And so it doesn't have to be the most monumental or the most sort of, you know, muscular book of them all. This is a soft cover with a three-piece binding. Um, you know, it feels very informal. But it's this incredible collection by this young photographer photographing in the periphery of Paris, the suburbs that has become the home of many different migrant communities. And at first glance, you're looking through and it seems as though, oh, well, this is kind of a classic documentation of you know things that are going on in the suburbs. Um, there's some amazing gatefolds that you can open up to. And uh, there's not a whole lot of information given on the page. And so you might not know that this is all staged work, that this has been work that has, the photographer has assembled and staged as a way of challenging the ideas of what happens in those landscapes and what these communities you know, are, are up to and how they organize themselves. And so it's a great challenge to sort of our expectations of what we might see in, in this landscape. And there's subtle paper changes that's really beautiful. Um, it's published by Loose Joints in Marseille. Um, just very sophisticated, just enough. There's a contextualizing text by Clement Cheroux in the back. So, you know, this is not necessarily something that sort of, it is, I think, almost 10 years of work, but it might not feel as though, like, oh, I'm the photo book of the year, and yet, it works, and it's just kind of this, like, just enough, and really well done. But I'd love to hear. Leslie, could you say a little bit about the final jury? The final we jury. we had no contact with them. I, I'm not even sure I know who it was. Well, um, now that you're asking me, and we're on live TV, <laughs> I'm going no, to we all, not we don't want to reveal everybody everybody's does. name. So <laughs> we will have a card. There's actually, if you look at the videos, it's in the back. Actually, you know what we can do? Alex, would you put that in the chat of Thank the you. jurors for the final? I will yeah. encourage, because I'm not even going to stretch <laughs> the, my brain to think talk. about Alex, it. I have been doing this for 10 years. Take, yeah, you have um, a lot of, this is your favorite jury, we know. So nothing of course, else needs to be No, but it was, is a, as always, an amazing collection. And I think, you know, the. Final jury happens in Paris. I think this feel felt especially urgent and of the moment, which is not something clearly when we talk about these that we can separate, even if it's something that's been excavated 
from almost 50 years ago, there's still like something that speaks to the now mm -hmm. in that selection. Yeah, but that was that was really my why I asked the question because uh, the final selections seem to have more of a European slant to them, mm. right? Well, I, that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> I think that. One might say, looking at the shortlist, often there's a preponderance of American selections. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it could be a corrective. Um, I, I agree. So, um, but there, I, I would love to bring our audience in. There have been a lot of great questions. And in fact, a number of people have asked something similar to this. And you can all respond as you see fit. So the question is, what are, you, are there some trends that you noticed in the submissions? Um, and does this give you a, a sense of you know, where we are? with photo books and maybe even where we're headed. And I imagine the answers to that question might be as different as each of you. So I hope you all might speak to it. I think gender issue was one of the big trend this year. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, there were so many uh, publications that referenced uh, the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. oh, that we created sure. a separate category, right? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that was a special mention. Mm -hmm. And it consisted of probably half a dozen um, selected titles. Mm -hmm. uh, at, but there were, there were uh, quite a number that I would categorize as political statements. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we mentioned two that had to do with environmental mm -hmm. issues, having to do with uh, climate change and uh, various ecological devastations, mm -hmm. but also a lot of titles having to do with gender issues, mm -hmm. body issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, Were there social. any sort of material trends? In other words, not so much about the subjects of the book, but about sort of their I mean, physicality that you... I will say that the soft yeah. cover form has really been ascendant for the last few years mm -hmm. and continues to be. This idea, again, that you don't have to monumentalize mm -hmm. a body of work by publishing it. Mm -hmm. And also, beautiful, intimate scale can be just as effective. Mm -hmm. um, I would say those are some things. But again, in this case, like that book is dealing with a, a population that has been surveilled over the last 20 years. Um, and so there's a strong political dimension and this sense of it being like a little bit like a dossier mm -hmm. is like, again, like speaking so directly to the subject matter. Yeah. One of the things I was so struck by with, with that book is that the, the, the prints from that series, right, and it was, it's, it's a body of work that's been in existence for, for quite some time, right, I think mm -hmm. 2008, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so that as it came back through the book, one of the things I love about this book is that it isn't the book I would have necessarily anticipated for that work because of the scale of the prints mm -hmm. and the way that they're presented and, the, and that they're photographs that are approaching the conditions of history painting and they have that kind of constructiveness. Mm -hmm. The verticality is such a revelation with this work. The, 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 the vertical, it, like it's, it's the kind of its own argument with the history of painting as something that we think of as the tableau. Mm -hmm. And so I love that it upsets that and then it gives you the, the kind of gatefolds and opens out and mm -hmm. start, you know, and, and that kind of play is really beautiful. And then the, there's some of the kind of the paper makes me think about magazines and that kind of glossiness. Mm -hmm. And if we think about the reportage, the kind of surveillance that you're mentioning with the, with the Bonia, the kind of these kind of areas around Paris, that it does really kind of hold that tension of like, what are we really seeing through this work? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it makes you start to think that it's like a magazine. And I think it reinforces some of right. that sense that you're getting mm -hmm. that read on reality, whereas it's going to push back on you in all of these really interesting ways. Yeah, and I think that tension, I mean, this, is sort of a form that is of the street. It feels a little bit looser and more raw, and yet it contains these images that are so, you know, almost Jeff Wall in their mm -hmm. scope and nature and their construction. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because Clement's, the name of Clement's text is uh, the internal intention, uh, you know, also kind of underscoring just the tension that's sort of throughout this work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I think, like, in terms of, you know, some of trends too, I mean, it's funny because one of the things with, with Jess's book that mm -hmm. I love is that I think there's a way in which it might initially, maybe even because of Jess's previous work, that it's, that this book kind of is focused on queer subjects, but I actually think it's more that it has a queer sensibility. Mm -hmm. 
and in, yeah. it, and it's and it's about a way of then of how that informs the looking that we do and this notion of you know look at me like you love me there's mm -hmm. a kind of provocation to the reader and to the Absolutely. viewer mm -hmm. and the way that Jess inserts themselves into the book is almost a conversation with the self mm -hmm. and so one of the things I love across some of these books is the way that they're really getting us to think about more effective relations mm -hmm. to photographs and to the conditions of being a subject yeah. um, and kind of and how we relate to yeah. who is on the other side. Of and there was the another fantastic book, which I'm in a totally space on the photographer's name, D'Angelo Williams. Yeah. Yeah. D'Angelo yeah. Lovell Williams. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lovell Williams, which, which was a, mm -hmm. uh, in a similar category, right? Like the um, exploring the black body, exploring the queer black body in, in provocative sexual ways um, that uh, was, you know, super fascinating in some, in some moments shocking but like such a powerful kind of provocation to what it is to be seen photographically. And while we're talking about Jess, they actually are watching, so hi Jess, <laughs> and, and asked us an interesting question that Leslie maybe will ask you to speak to first, but how do you feel that the photo book landscape has changed over the last 10 years as access to creating a book has, at least in some ways, become more accessible or democratic? And you know, there's been an increase, I think we all agree, in self-publishing and independent presses. And so can you sort of, you know, having been involved with this over the last yeah. 10 years, I would love to hear you speak to that arc. Well, there is a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things we all know and is part of that question. And that means that, I mean, you do see a level of sophistication across the board in all categories that certainly hadn't been there before. Even a book that takes a very classic approach of the sort of viewing a framed print in a white cube gallery space mm -hmm. has all of these other earmarks of consideration of just how to elevate a, a blank page, an image across from a blank page, an image across from a blank page, but to, to create a platform that really elevates it to an aesthetic experience that you engage with on a level that I think hadn't really been considered in so deep of a w of a manner mm -hmm. previously, mm -hmm. and and you know even something like just the attention, uh, you know the designer this designer of Latoya Ruby Fraser Duncan White actually had three different books uh, on this short list, and so also just seeing how <laughs> there's sort of this. Um, Sorry, so. uh, just that you can have something with that formality and precision and beauty side to side with something that's you know something a little more raw and immediate, and that they all work on their uh, you know on the terms that they set for themselves. Mm -hmm. But is that because uh, it's technically more possible, or because there are more adventurous publishers now who aren't? maybe so concerned about the bottom line, they I really want to work more collaboratively with uh, photographers and artists. I think all of the above, and I think there are more photographers and designers as makers, yeah. that, so they're sort of looking at from those perspectives. I will take a minute to thank our final jury because we also tried to include photographers on that. Sunil Gupta was one of the final jurors, and Lacoste for the Sorry, Institute for Photography on. in Lille, mm -hmm. France. Holly Roussel, who had been a curator um, for Periphoto. Pauline Vermar, independent curator. And I think that's all of them. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, so just oh, like- Alain. Oh, Alain. Oh, Alain Kemen, who is um, a professor of sociology. So I think, um, that doesn't answer your question as to why or how, but I think that each of these jurors, just as yourselves, come at this form from your own perspective and enlarge it in participating in it. And so it's just, it's, it's not that you get one book in your life and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's sort of become something that everybody from students to senior curator, curators to directors feel is a critical part of the practice and have something to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, can I offer a hypothesis? And, please. And then please shoot me down. I love a hypothesis. Um, like where print as a, as a commercial venture has really, um, as we all know, shrunk over the last 20, 
plus years. Um, I feel like there's also, like it, it, when I started working in photography, it was like the giant name of the photographer on the big glossy book and um, that each book has to make an argument for itself in a whole different way as a material thing. Um, and I think that's what's so exciting about the landscape of photo books now. Does that seem? Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. I think you've said it. Yeah. So, and so well. there, is, there is this renegade group of new publishers, publishers. a lot of who yeah. come from God like zines yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, underground yeah. mm -hmm. sources and they're just willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to fulfill the vision of the photographers. And I saw, I'm, oh. uh, sorry, I am an independent publisher myself, so I often invite that, that good designer to give me like a creative idea. When you talk about that the popularity of the soft cover, when I work with a designer, they like to give me like a creative idea for the cover to cost down that the production. So I think that the reason why we mm. see that the more soft cover is the independent publisher try to come up with that the creative idea for like a publication of the book. And then, and then the reason why you see like a more gatefold is that the designer step forward to the photo book industry more than ever. So mm. I think that the uh, publisher, photographer, designer <coughs> act together to make a beautiful book more than ever right now. And I saw a note in the, the questions about um, Phyllis Christopher and it signaled something for me because I, I mean, it was a question about kind of whether this was the book on the floor and actually it was Last Day in Lagos so that, I, that I'd put down, but it made me think about both for someone like Phyllis Christopher and I think Marilyn Nance, there's also this way in which like there's, an op there's a book that's overdue mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. a way in which I think one of the things we're seeing manifest in, in books and in, right, I mean, it's like it's always happening, but I feel like it's really coming through in a beautiful way right now is the revival of certain archives, mm -hmm. of, like projects that were really overlooked mm -hmm. or ways in which um, um, work that had like maybe largely existed on the margins and that was an important way of, of its life and its existence but it's finding a new platform kind of in this moment and I think that's also something really kind of great in in the work that we've seen and, yeah. and that was another trend right like we had these kind of rediscoveries or re-examinations or just sort of lost archives like that incredible trilogy of from the Egyptian photo studio oh, ben Leo. Ben Leo. Ben Leo. Yeah. 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 Um, and the, the dark, I think Dark Rooms was, was one of the other books where it's like, this is happening more broadly in the culture. We're, we're looking back at what we've, we've missed yeah. in the most, and that's so a glossy. So speaking of looking back at what we missed, <laughs> we're, we, decide, we intentionally decided this couldn't possibly fit in an hour. So all of our Aperture Photo Book Clubs are under an hour, but not this one. <laughs> but, um, but we're already still pushing way past mm. what we want to do. So what I would love to do is take one last audience question, mm -hmm. which is to ask each of you if you have a favorite photo book of all time. Now oh, I no. know this is going to be very <laughs> difficult to answer, but if you would please try uh, to name at least one of your favorite photo books of all time. I think everyone would be very, and including myself, would be very curious to hear that. Mm. And then we'll, um, and then we'll close it. Actually, how about this? While you're thinking about that, <laughs> let me just one. say that all of the 35 shortlisted books. Um, if you are in New York City, um, or if you're visiting New York City, they are on view at Printed Matter through February 26th. So you're seeing how much fun we're having holding these in our hands. You can go, you can see the ingenious methods that have been devised to allow you to really experience these in all their glory. So um, go to Printed Matter if you can visit New York. And that exhibition of the shortlisted books also travels. So you can look on Aperture's website and see it in other places around the world in the coming months. Um, so that was my mention of Printed <laughs> Matter, which was meant to give you all an extra couple of seconds. Who, who's the brave soul who wants to go first? Okay. Oh, I'll go. Um, I have a book called, I think, Nostalgia, which is mm. a collection of kind of early color or colorized photographs. It was a color process with glass plates, but it's basically a tour of um, the Russian Empire uh, in like 1910, the early 1900s. And they're just, um, I never thought that I would get to see that world. And it, it did such a deep look into it. Mm. Is it an old book, a new book? Just no, it came out about 10 years ago, okay. I think. So that's old, I guess. I don't, it's new. Medium. 10 years. <laughs> what is old? Depends. 
Okay, I'm going to pick one of many because there is no such thing as a favorite, yeah. favorite book. It's often the book I last actually saw go out into the world that I've worked on, but I'm going to go way <laughs> back into the archive and say one of the books that I first was like, what and how did this thing come into being was uh, the Twin Palms book about Mike Disfarmer. Mm. Mm. It's on black paper printed with white ink, white and gray ink on the black paper. So it's, it's sort of the reverse of your classic duotone. And it's just... It's such a remarkable small scale album, and just as a as a physical experience, as a way of of bringing the viewer into the tactility of that reproduction, it's just really it's quite incredible. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I'm gonna go take it out of the library. Yeah. My favorite book must be like a Nobuyoshi Araki's mm -hmm. Sentimental Journey. Mm -hmm. The reason why I think that uh, this book remarkable is because he really show who he is, like a hundred twenty percent or two hundred percent. Even include that uh, his wife's dead body in a book, mm -hmm. which is not easy. Mm -hmm. So he have like a, such a strong determination as a photographer, and he have a no hiding. He doesn't care about any judgment from other people. I don't think it's easy things to do, and then many people make a book, but. I recognize you only show like a 50% of who you are or a 100% of who you are. If you want to be like a famous photographer or a good photographer, you have to really show more than 100% mm -hmm. of who you are. I find that this sentimental journey by Araki really defined that the best book of the history for sure. <laughs> I would pick up a little bit on what Leslie's saying. The, uh, you know, I, I go through waves of what's my uh, current favorite, uh, and it's often the last one. So I'm tempted to say <laughs> uh, Flinda's family, but I'll also cheat a little bit and say an aperture book, no, which is Latoya <laughs> Ruby Fraser's A Notion of Family, which mm -hmm. is an favorites. incredible book about her upbringing in Braddock, Pennsylvania, which was another uh, devastated post-industrial, post-steel town where, you know, half the population was infected with diseases from this contaminated city. And uh, she just so bravely documented her whole life and family uh, in, this, in this blighted landscape. Love that book. Um, so I, I feel like this is also going to be in conversation with, with Aperture here because um, it's, you know, favorite, favorite is hard. I also think that all books should be pop-up books. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I want, like, Oh, no, not that again. I, no, everything should be a pop-up book. I, I want, I want, like, you know, I want a concertina. I want things to drop out and, like, so I want, I want confetti to explode on my face. Um, and so this is going to, this is the total opposite of this, but it's, it's, but it's, um, what I'm working on related to what I'm working on right now, but something like Ernest Cole's House of Bondage has been oh, yeah. really important to me. Um, and I, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in this question of how kind of photographs motivate us, how they move us, how, how we make arguments through them, um, and how they, the photographs that we put into books go out and live all sorts of different lives afterwards. And that's definitely a book that um, his work got seen through and then kind of pulled and really in some ways divorced from, from him to be part of a, the kind of in service of the anti-apartheid movement um, in all sorts of really complicated ways. Um, and so it, to me, it's one of those photo books that really gets us thinking about kind of where they sit and how they move through the world. Um, so I go back to it often. Mm -hmm. And if the camera is a weapon, the photo book can be a weapon <laughs> too. <laughs> Just to I like it. Totally. Um, so thank you, wonderful jurors, um, for letting us in on your thought process. Thank you, Leslie, for continuing to lead the Perry Photo Aperture Photo Book Awards bringing all of these to our attention. Um, thank you to Photo Focus for your support of the Aperture Photo Book Club. It means a tremendous amount to us and to the audience that gathered, to everyone whose questions we didn't get to answer. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we hope you make it to Printed Matter to see these books, and we hope to see you again soon. 
Um, for the next edition, wait, one more thank you. In addition to Photo Focus, I have to thank Candle Productions and our wonderful Aperture colleagues who do so much. Alex, Brianna, Frank, and a lot of other people to make the Photo Book Awards happen, to make this uh, Photo Book Club happen. So thank you to our colleagues at Aperture too. So, and thank you to the audience. This is why we do it. We're glad you joined us. And uh, until the next time. <laughs>